Okay, so it's time for another YouTube video. Uh, today I want to talk about our workhorse Vortec 8.1 starters. Because uh, I take quite a few phone calls and I kind of notice trends. And I notice lately I'm getting a lot of calls where people uh, are having troubleshooting and they find out the, um, the starter is, is the, at fault. So they replace the starter. But I need to let people know there are different starters out there for a 8.1 Vortec and you need to know what's available and what to choose and what not to choose. Uh, the picture you're looking at right now, this is a video I did a little going back, what, six years ago. So six years ago, I had a no-start situation on, on RRV. So uh, it turned out the starter was fine. It was just a bad solenoid. So I did this video of removing the starter and replacing just the solenoid. And, you know, that was many years ago, and it still works fine to this day. But I am getting about 75,000 miles, so I'm about to get to that point. I may drop the starter to check the condition of the, of the brushes. Uh, so I know a lot of times if you're on the road and your starter fails, you just got to get what you can get. But if you get the wrong starter, it could lead to other problems. So I'm going to show you the problem starter. Because um, there is a, a, an aftermarket starter, same as ours. But then there's another aftermarket starter that's somewhat different and gives, it gives trouble. That's when this, this starter right here, this is a Ultima starter. You can see it, it, it bolts up and it does work, but it is designed and looks completely different. And the problem that we're having is with this particular starter, the heat shield, like here in my video, here in my picture, you can see the heat shield here. Well, the heat shield won't bolt up and people will bolt up the new starter without the heat shield and then on the next problem is you start getting knock sensor codes because the knock sensor gets so hot it begins to melt. So that's a warning for you if you install this type of starter it's going to lead to trouble unless you fabricate a new heat shield. Also if you've just got your RV used and you look under there and you find your starter does not have a heat shield, someone's left it off, you need to get one and you can get one Right here at Brazzles RV, there's there's the part number for it, and there's the heat shield in case yours is, is missing. Um, now, there's another thing I want to recommend. If your starter fails on you on the road, it's easy enough to change yourself. You can see this video here. But don't let the parts house get a hold of your OEM starter. Keep your OEM factory starter and take it to a local rebuild shop and get it rebuilt. I think you'll find you'll have a better starter because you never know about these, you know, the China starters that you get if they got as many windings and may have a cheap solenoid, whatever it is, to get that low price point. Uh, a lot of times, if you take a starter apart, it's usually the, the solenoid is at fault or the brushes just wear down. In fact, for me, every vehicle I own, once they get about 90,000 miles, I will go ahead and myself drop the starter, install new brushes. You know, put it back together and I'm I'm good for another 90,000 miles usually. I, I've, knock on wood, I've never had a starter fail on me by, by doing that. Um, but it is odd that I'm getting phone calls on these starters because I always ask people how many miles they have on their RV and what year. So of course most of my calls are for workhorse chassis between you know 2000 and 2010. Uh, and it surprised me some RVs even with like 28,000 miles low mileage yet the starter is bad. So it seems like mileage really doesn't correlate with these starters failing. It's just just age. Um, it's kind of interesting that uh, that it, these RVs with such low mileage can still have a starter fail. It'd be interesting to know exactly what the failure was, you know, to get uh, disassembled and, and di diagnosed. So so in a pinch, you grab your starter, the O'Reillys or whatever, but hang on to your OEM starter when you get back home, get it rebuilt. And I'm gonna get I'm gonna crawl underneath the RV and show you what I'm talking about, about these um, knock sensors and what to look out for when they get hot and, and begin to melt and give you trouble. Oh, while I'm at it here, because this is my video I did a couple, you know, four, seven years ago, whenever it was, you need a weird socket. If you go to disassemble the starter to remove the solenoid, that's called an E5 socket, that weird little type of Torx bit that it has. Let me make sure I said that right. Yeah, it's called the E5. Where's my notes? Yeah, there it is. There's E5 socket. You'll need that socket to get that uh, solenoid removed. But it's easy enough. You can rebuild your own starter most times. And 
and actually if you just get it apart clean it up you know grease the shafts and bushings if you find the the brushes are worn take it to a local rebuilder and then have them uh, put you in a new set of brushes for you I'm trying to find the brushes so here it is I, I fr freeze the video here and you can see where the brushes are so you can easily just take this end plate off take it to a local rebuilder have them solder in your, uh, a new set of brushes and usually you're good to go for another 70,000 miles or, or 100 you know who knows but uh, but that's usually a, a good thing to do because these heavy duty windings and stuff these OEM starters are pretty tough you see the little the gear reduction unit take it apart put a little grease on that put it all back together and you're good to go like I said I did mine about seven years ago and it's been working fine but it's getting to that age I'm about ready to pull it back off just to inspect the brushes and see how much life is left in them all right so now let's go crawl under the RV okay so I'm under the RV full tight squeeze here trying to get a good spot where you can see this can move around get focus so there she is okay so there's my starter and you can see my solenoid that I put on lifetime warranty from seven years ago it's been working just fine and you can see the heat shield right there so that's the heat shield that gets gets removed and sometimes that get installed or if you replace the starter it doesn't come with one it's going to give you trouble and so right there is our knock sensor so you can see where the heat shield is located and it's right under the exhaust manifold so it's critical to keep the heat off that knock sensor because if once that heat shield is gone that knock sensor your wires are going to start melting and this little on this little plastic connector and it's going to kill your knock sensor then you start getting knock sensor codes and you're going to wonder what the heck's going on so let's go check out the other side make sure your um, your knock sensor your, your um, heat shields in place on that also let's go let's crawl to the other side okay let me try to get the camera up and let you see it so also here on the other side the driver's side you can see our knock sensor you also see our heat shield so you want to make sure that's in place they put that on there for a reason and that brings me to another topic let's talk about knock sensors let me get back inside let me tell you a few things about those that that we need to know because that can be a problem okay so back inside I want to briefly talk about in fact I got me a little folder here I was going to talk about make a separate video just on knock sensors so if you happen to have a you ever get the like the, the like a p0327 p0332 or p0325 all that has to do with the, the knock sensors and a lot of times we'll get that those codes on our workhorse chassis in our 8.1 vortex and the first thing people do they change out the knock sensor well that's a lot of times not say 9% of the time that's not the problem if you get any of these codes while driving down the road your check engine light comes on you have one of these codes you need to look most likely it's the mass airflow sensor causing this because it's our mass airflow sensors job to control the fuel ratio and talks to the computer talks to the O2 sensors all that stuff and they get out of calibration we start to run lean we run lean we start getting knocks so the knock sensor when you get those codes the knock sensor is doing its job it's telling you hey I just heard a knock and I'm not supposed to be hearing a knock I'm letting you know about it so fix it so first thing people do they change out the knock sensor and then they drive it down the road and the knock sensor come, light comes back on again and so further troubleshooting it usually ends up being a mass airflow sensor in fact anybody that's got a workhorse chassis and you've never changed your mass airflow sensor you probably need to go ahead and change it that's going to be one of the most common parts that gets changed out but I'll, uh, I'm going to do a specific video just on these knock sensors and how to troubleshoot them and stuff to make sure that's it Anyways, so I'm going to update you on that starter deal. And remember, if you happen to have a no-start situation, we have the relay on the firewall. In this video, I go through that on how to uh, troubleshoot that to, to make, make sure the, that it's not the relay. A simple $5 relay can simulate. It makes it look like you got a bad starter when you don't have a bad starter. So check that relay first. Thanks for watching. Have a blessed day. See you. Bye.